This is Laura Klein coming to you from my office to talk about how to write your very first literary analysis full paper with research and all that good stuff. So we've been going over some specific stuff in class having to do with different parts of fiction of short stories. So we've looked at things like setting and character and figurative language. And now you're going to write a paper based on those things. So the most important thing about this paper is that you really want it to stay sort of contained within the story. You don't want to go outside the story to look at context, which is what you'll do with your next essay. So we're not looking at stuff like the author's biography or, you know, the way women were treated at the time that the story was written or stuff like that. You're really looking at for what's in the story having to do with those tropes or literary devices that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to start out just by talking about general essay structure and how to structure a literary analysis essay, which is very much like the kinds of essays that you've probably written before in English 101 or other classes that you've done writing for. And then I'll talk a little bit specifically about how to write about literature, and I'll give you an example along with my friend here, Ernest Hemingway, from his story, which you should have read, Hills Like White Elephants, which is in your textbook. But I did ask you to read that again um, if you haven't already read it or if you sort of forgot what it's about. It's only about four pages long. So if you haven't read it, pause it right now and head to page 114 in your book and read that story and then come back. Okay. So I'm going to start with structure. So the basic essay structure is three parts. The first part is an introduction. And the introduction really needs to do three things. And those three things are it needs to hook your reader's attention or grab your reader's attention. And that's the first thing it needs to do. So you want to begin with something provocative or interesting at the beginning of your introductory paragraph, not just, I'm going to write about Hemingway. You don't want to do that. You want to have something like a quote or a fact or a statistic or a rhetorical question. There's a number of things that you could put there at the beginning of your essay to hook your reader's attention. The next thing you want to do is provide any background information that you think is pertinent that your reader is going to need to know in order to understand your essay. So if you need to write about the publication date of the story or um, the author's background, just get it out of your system, put it in your introductory paragraph to sort of ease them into the argument that you're making about the text, because that is the third thing that will appear in your introductory paragraph, and that is your thesis statement. Thesis statements are tricky, and we'll be working with them throughout the semester. And I have a video later in the semester about how to avoid problematic thesis statements when you're working with context. But today I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of how to work on a thesis statement and move from analysis to argument, which I talk about in my summary and analysis video, um, having to do with the specific story that you're reading for this week and that I'm using as my example in this video. Okay. So that's the introduction. Thesis comes at the end. You sort of ease your way into the thesis, but you, you want it at the end of the first paragraph. You don't want to save it for the end of your paper. Um, in academic writing, you sort of want to put all your cards on the table at the beginning, right? And that's because it, it's a practical reason, really. When you start writing an abstract, if you're going to get an article published, if you're going to graduate school in the humanities or the social sciences, you really want to have the argument that you're going to make up front so that when other researchers are looking into your article to see whether or not they want to use it for their research, they know what your point is up front. They don't have to read through the whole article to know the point you're going to make and whether or not it will be useful in their research. So that's the practical reason why we put our thesis at the beginning of the paper. So the second part, part two of your essay, is the body of the essay. And if you're writing a five-paragraph essay, um, there, you sh there would be three body paragraphs. But we are probably writing something that's quite a bit longer than five paragraphs. So you could have many body paragraphs. But we will start when you're doing your pre-writing at identifying three main points that you want to make throughout your essay, and then you can add on points as you do your research. And the other thing to know about your thesis is as you draft your body of your essay, it might change your thesis, and you can always go back to make sure that your thesis reflects what you wrote in the body of your essay. It's a constant revision cycle. Okay. Um, so the body of the essay 
those paragraphs have a specific function, and I call them pie paragraphs, like pie that you eat, P-I-E. And what that stands for is point, illustration, and explanation. Okay, so the point is the topic sentence for the paragraph, and the topic sentence is like a thesis for the paragraph, and it supports the thesis of the paper. So you're going to write your topic sentence, and then you're going to illustrate the point you make in your topic sentence, I, with a, probably a quotation or a paraphrase or a summary from your primary text, your short story. And then your explanation is your analysis. It's how you connect that quote that you're including, that moment from the story, that scene that you're summarizing, back to the argument that you're making in your thesis, so P-I-E. And you can have as many body paragraphs as you need, right, to, to prove your point, to meet the length requirement, all that good stuff. And then you have your conclusion paragraph. And the big function of the conclusion paragraph is to answer the question, so what? It's to make the arguing that you've done relevant to your reader. You don't want to be too repetitive in your conclusion. I see a lot of really repetitive conclusions where students are going in and they're just basically putting the information that they put in their introduction, but they're putting it in their conclusion instead don't want to see that. I really want you to work on making it relevant. This is really hard. I have a hard time with it myself, um, and I have a lot of practice. So you just need to keep practicing to make your conclusion um, relevant and engaging. So that's just a quick little refresher on basic ex essay structure. And now we're going to have a specific example, which is, you know, I have my, my friend here, Ernest Hemingway. These are my favorite literary puppets. Um, and so he wrote this story, Hills Like White Elephants, as you've read. It's a very short story, and that can sometimes be a bigger challenge than having a really long story with a lot of material to pull from. Because a very short story, you have to have a concise argument, but you also have to have an argument that has enough material to flesh out your essay. So I'm going to do kind of a brief reading. What I'm doing here would probably be, not be enough to fill out a whole essay. I would have to talk about some additional literary devices if I were going to write an essay of 1,500 words, the length requirement for your essay. Isn't that right? That's right. Um, so the first thing that you want to do when you're getting ready to write an essay about a short story is you want to read the essay, you want to read the story probably more than once. And as you're reading it, you want to carefully annotate it. And there are a couple of things that you're looking for um, when you're annotating. So I've got my story here, annotations, writing in the margins. Okay, so write in your book. Um, and if you really don't want to, write, want to write in your book, then get on another piece of paper and take careful notes as you're reading. You might want to do one read, just a fresh read, to see what your initial impressions of the story are, and then go back and really try to find some things. So what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for patterns, things that repeat over throughout the story, okay? So in this story, for example, I notice that they keep talking about how hot it is, and they keep talking about alcohol. Um, and even the words that they use in their conversation, a lot of those are really repetitive. So I might try to mark where I see this repetition, where I see the same thing coming up over and over again. And then the other thing you're looking for is moments that cause you cognitive dissonance. What's cognitive dissonance? Well, it's what you maybe just felt when I said cognitive dissonance, which is you think you understand what's going on in the story, but this part is really weird, and so I just don't know what's going on anymore. Okay, so cognitive dissonance are moments that just make you pause and go, huh? And those are important parts. If something seems really weird and out of place, it's really weird and out of place. Authors don't do things by accident. Um, when you have a short story that's like four pages long and it shows up in your Norton anthology as literature, um, it's not like somebody's diary entry where they just wrote down everything they were thinking, right? Each word is carefully considered. Authors, especially when we get to poetry, but are really conscious of what they're doing. So if something seems really weird and out of place, it's weird and out of place, and it's like that for a reason. And those can be really good ways into the story to talk about what's going on. Okay. So when I was reading uh, Hemingway's story, what I noticed is that they talk about scenery a lot. So the, the setting is really prevalent. There's a lot of emphasis put on the setting, 
where the story is taking place. And the story is mostly told in dialogue, right? There's not a lot of interjection from an omniscient or even a limited narrator. And when there is interjection, it's usually to describe that the characters are looking at the setting or it's just to describe the setting. So obviously the setting is gonna play a major role. And I also found that the narration probably plays some kind of role as well because it's odd, right? It's weird narration. It's not, it's not the way that we are typically used to seeing a story being told. So I am going to narrow my focus, which is what you're going to need to do after you do these initial readings. You need to decide what it is you're going to write about. So in this little example, I'm just going to talk about setting and how the setting impacts meaning, because that was the most prevalent thing to me in the story while I was reading it. And you got to remember when you're doing literary analysis, it's not like you're trying to solve a puzzle for which there is one answer. It's not a riddle. And, it's, you know, it doesn't fit neatly together. There's a number of different possible and potential readings of a story that different people are going to come and they're going to approach stories different ways. And that's all right. It's all right for it to be, you know, a different reading than your friend or your neighbor or somebody else taking the class and talking on the discussion board. In fact, that's awesome if you all have different readings because that means you're really engaging with trying to find something unique that stands out to you about the story. Um, and it's not wrong. The only thing that I'm really looking at is whether or not it's supportable and whether or not you're supporting it, which means that if, if I were to say that the story is about aliens, and I was just saying that because that's a really off the wall, you know, um, interpretation. Well, obviously it's about aliens, but then I had no proof to support that reading. Would that be okay? No. No, it would not. So I have to find a supportable thesis. And so I'm going to start with the setting, and I'm going to start working on the thesis. So I'm going to just start by asking myself, well, what is the setting like? And how does it seem to relate to the meaning of the story? How are setting and meaning, you know, how are they working together throughout the story? And I am going to do that, and that's going to be analysis, right, when I start to weave those two things together. So what I noticed throughout the story is that the setting is characterized by being sort of transitory, right? They're at a train station. You don't stay at a train station very long preferably, hopefully, right? They're just there at the bar to have a couple of drinks and then they'll be going on the, the train to Madrid. Um, it's hot there, okay? It's unpleasant. It's also full of like sort of straight lines and it gives it, which gives it sort of a crossroads feeling. And there, there's something in the distance to which the the woman in the story in particular continues to gaze at, to gaze at this, this thing in the distance. And what this thing is, is a bunch of white rolling hills that she tells her partner th um, that they look like white elephants. And I might pause here for a moment to talk about this, this story because this story can be difficult upon first reading to know what's going on. So just being able to explain what's happening in the story is not analysis. It's a step sort of before analysis. So if you're working with one of the more abstract stories or confusing stories in the book on the list, some of them are have very obvious plot points and others are more abstract. This happens to be more abstract. So you may have to take a minute to think about what's happening. Well, you have this man and this woman who are on their way to somewhere. They're, they're coming from somewhere else, right? We learn later in the story that they've been traveling for a while. They have a lot of stickers on their luggage from the different places that they've been, and they're headed somewhere else. And you can tell that they're having a conflict with each other, and that comes up throughout their dialogue in the story. And he's asking her, he's telling her that it's okay for her to do something, but that she doesn't have to do it if she doesn't want to. Well, if you read through the story enough, what you realize He's, he wants her to do is to have an abortion. So the woman is pregnant, and she's trying to decide whether or not she's going to have an abortion, which is what they are leaving to do. Um, but the man is telling her that she doesn't have to do it if she doesn't want to. She's incredibly into, indecisive, and so is he about this. So they go back and forth and back and forth sort of about, um, oh, well, it's not a big deal. 
but if it's a big deal to you, you don't have to do it. Well, it's not a big deal to me. So if you read the story, you can see the repetition of their back and forth banter about the topic um, interspersed with the discussions of the scenery and also of, of the drinks that they're drinking at the bar. Um, so to come back to the setting, this sort of hot setting, a transitory setting, setting um, that is uncomfortable and hopefully temporary is reflective of the state that the woman is in and the state that they both are in, right? Um, this, this sort of purgatorial state of indecision that they are both in while they wait in this train station. But it's, it's really much bigger than just this time that they have to spend in the train station. And, you know, it even emphasizes at how fleeting it is at the top of page 115 where it says that the train, oh, they're going to Barcelona. I think I said Madrid. Oops. Um, oh, they are going to Madrid. It was very hot, and the express from Barcelona would come in 40 minutes. It stopped at this junction for two minutes and went on to Madrid. So they're here. They can't stay long. They have to quickly make a decision whether or not to get on this this uh, train. So really what they're in is in, the, in this sort of pressure cooker of a, search, uh, of a situation. Okay, so then I'm asking myself how this relates to the meaning of the story, which I just talked about. And one of the other things in this, story is whether or not we know if she makes a choice. There are some indications that she's making a choice. Um, the way that she's looking at the scenery in the, in the distance is, we can think about that as the way that she's looking in the future. Um, and we can think about what the hills looking like white elephants means. She's also, there's a part where she's discussing at the bottom of page 115, again, about trying this new liquor that she sees a sign for. She sees a sign for it, and she tries it, and it tastes like licorice. And what she says is everything tastes of licorice, especially all the things you've waited so long for, like absence. And, you know, this indicates that if, if you've waited for something and there's a possibility that the reality of that thing is bitter, and she, that's what she's seeing in this relationship with this man, right, is maybe perhaps this woman has been waiting for – to have a family, to start a family, to get married, and had a romantic notion of all of that. And, and here's the reality of it, and the reality is bitter. Um, and there's also indications about what their life or what their future will be like, and she says it isn't ours anymore. And this is on page 117. And he says it is ours, and she says, no, it isn't. And once they take it away, you can never give it, get it back. Well, who are they? Um, I, there, an argument can be made that they are the potential future children, and that this is perhaps an indication that she's considering keeping the baby um, with the knowledge that their life will change. And, and in this situation, it's the past that's romantic. It's all the things, all the traveling they did together that, um, that she can look longingly back at she can look back at the scenery behind her instead of the scenery in front of her. But again, this is all playing out with this, with the, what she's looking at and what she's seeing and how she's reacting. Um, and the other thing you can say is that the story itself never leaves the station, right? The entirety of the story takes place in the station. Eventually, the man walks away from her, leaves her, in order to move their luggage closer to the tracks so they can get on the train quickly when it comes, because um, it's coming in five minutes. And he goes and he gets to the back and he asks her, but they're still sitting at the bar. Do you feel better? And she says, I feel fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. Um, but they're still sitting in exactly the same place, right? From the beginning to the end of the story, nothing really changes. They go through these backs and forths, but they never leave the station, right? They never leave that setting. That's just a little close reading. So if I'm going to make my thesis, I have to really think about what what I thought when I asked myself the question of how the setting represents the meaning in the story. So primarily my analysis of that is that the setting is representative of the character's indecision and of the state of purgatory that they are stuck in while they're still in the station. And as long as they're indecisive, as long as they can't come to a decision, um, they'll be stuck in that same 
purgatorial state. And then I have to move my thesis from analysis to argument. And I do that by making it, making it into a strong claim about the meaning or intention of the story. And so what I've done there is come up with the thesis. In Hills Like White Elephants, Hemingway shows that indecision is a type of purgatory, and this is reflected in his choice of the train station as a setting. I'm leaving this sort of intentionally open and vague with the knowledge that as I start to close read through the story again with that thesis in mind, that I might find little details or things like I already when I was going through it talking through it to you noticed some things about um, romanticization of the past and the future that I might want to incorporate into that thesis as I continue to draft my essay but the whole purpose of going through the writing process is that you start with something more vague and you make it more specific as you go and eventually you'll end up with a thesis that's very specific and very arguable and per and really particular to your reading of the story and the way that you are interacting with it. And although you don't want to use the first person point of view in the story to say, I believe or I think that, really, it's, it's your reading. You're just showing how well you can support it. We're almost done here in the home stretch. So then the next thing I want to do is go back and find and read the story again with my thesis in mind and really find all of the moments to mark that support what I'm trying to say in my thesis. And I eventually want to come up with, for your pre-writing anyway, three at least main points that I want to make in support of my thesis. So one paragraph I might just characterize the way that the setting is described every time. And then I might characterize the woman's mental state, the man's mental state. There's a lot of different ways I could organize it, but really I'm trying to distill it into different points that I can plug into those PIE paragraphs. And then also the specific quotes from the text that I'm going to use to support those points. And we looked at a couple of those when I was just close reading. Basically this is close reading. This is what I call close reading. It's going back in the story and seeing how the pieces fit together and how each sentence is intentional. And this I talked about in the analysis video, right? I'm taking it apart so I can put it back together as my argument. Um, you're also required to do research for this essay. I in my reading of this got an idea from one of the questions at the end of the story which asks um, research the phrase white elephant and what's the significance of the phrase in the story's title. That gave me a really good idea for some way that I could do research that's not me looking at Hemingway's biography or, you know, um, the laws about abortion in Spain at the time, and that would be contextual. That would be me looking at the context of the story and I would be leaving the story. Instead, if I just think about what the significance of that, that image is, that figurative language, hills like white elephants, it's a simile, right? Um, if I look at the significance of that, I might be able to connect it, because after all, the hills are part of the setting, right? And so what is a white elephant? Well, a white elephant is a bad gift, right? Um, and I would want to further investigate that, you know, if you ever go to a white elephant party. Um, white elephants are gifts that you don't want, okay? And I mean, I think there's some really sad and obvious connections to what is happening with the, uh, particularly the female character in the story. And I think you could write about character in the story and you could focus either on what's going on with, with Jig, the female character, or the male character who is nameless um, throughout the story. But she, she currently has a gift that she doesn't want, right? Um, and is reacting to both of those both the idea that it's a gift and it's something that she doesn't want. It's a gift, but it's not right. Um, so the, t the title is really obviously connected. And I could do a little bit of research about, you know, what a white elephant is, and I could incorporate that without really leaving the text. Or I could also go on the library database and I could go to JSTOR or LCO database and I could I could try to find a, uh, an article that somebody else had written specifically about the image of white elephants in the story. So that would be useful also. And you really want to be careful with your research, that you're not going too far outside the story, you're not getting off topic, you're not using research just to like provide a, di a dictionary definition for something that you're using. That's not really integrated research. So you want to make sure you're doing integrated research. All right. So last but not least, for this 
week, you're going to do your pre-writing for the essay, and in your pre-writing, you're basically going to do what I just did. You're going to choose the story that you want to write about, you know, read through a few. Don't just choose the shortest one, because like you may be seeing with this very short story, is if I were trying to write like a five-page essay on this, I would really have to go deep into what I have to write an essay that's longer than the story itself, okay? So there can be some real challenges to choosing the a story that's shorter. So you really want to choose one that you're reacting to and that you find confusing and provocative and all of that good stuff. Um, so read through them and then you want to read your story once just with an open mind and then you maybe want to come up with a sort of scratch thesis or some questions, read carefully and annotate again, do some close reading, work on a specific and arguable thesis and then find the places that support it in the story to come up with sort of three supporting points and quotes that support them and then you want to think how could research enhance this and then find yourself a good reliable source that you've evaluated and if you have questions about whether it's a good reliable source you will email me um, and ask. There's a list of websites that you can't use but I'm sure I've missed some that are also not the best to use so if you have any questions about whether or not it's a good website, it's really easy to send me an email and I can just say yes or no before you get too far into your process. That's about it. Good luck on your essay and if you want to come in and talk about your story with me, I'm available in office hours. Otherwise, I will look forward to taking a look at your pre-writing and Hemingway says goodbye too. Bye.